You're listening to Thunder Quack Podcast Network. This is the Thunder Quack Podcast. The official podcast of Thunder Quack Podcast Network. Where anything can happen. So strap yourselves in and hold on to your butts. It's Thunderquack time! Hello and welcome back to the Thunderquack podcast. I am one of your hosts, Michael Cohen. And I'm your other host, Amanda Conkin. And I... We're listen, in surround sound. Listen to that beautiful, crispy sound. Oh, so good. It's so good. I can see it in the waveform. It's so beautiful. He took, uh, it, he took a photo earlier. I did. I was saying, he's uh, like, it'll be on. It'll have, By the time this is posted, it's on my Instagram already. Um, yeah, so go check it out. But uh, I, I, we have two microphones now. I, so we've got the... It's actually... The the one thing that's missing now, I think, is probably headphones. Because if oh. we had headphones, but then once we have headphones, then I have to figure out how to pipe both of our sound oh, yeah, through our headphones that, yeah. to each other. Um, because we would put the headphones, we would plug them into the. Oh into yeah, the, no, that wouldn't work. Yeah, I so I have to, I figure have I'd have to figure you. out how to do that. But for now, um, because what that'll do is we won't feel like we need to sh- to shout. We'll oh, be able to hear. Yeah. We'll put headphones on, hear your own voice but also hear each other nice. um but yeah other than that this is kind of the dream setup yeah i don't have a backrest right now so i'm kind of sitting up and forward it is you're very your your yoga posture is yeah. quite good yeah or is I, that to be lazy and just lean back but uh but yeah we've got these uh two awesome new microphones in this great setup and uh and we're recording on separate tracks so i'll be able to master <laughs> this and and get it nice and produced the quality is going to be fantastic it's, the room is coming together too the room is also yeah. coming together it's very close to finished um there's just a few things left for me to do uh yeah no it feels really good i'm gonna get it all right to the way that i want it and then baby number two is going to be born <laughs> and I'm not going to get to use it for a few yeah, months. Yeah, yeah. But, uh, but that doesn't matter. Cause I, uh, in October when we come back we've got the TV set up, I know, so we'll I'm actually so be able to sit and watch uh, arrow in here. It'll be, it's going to be really good. I'm, I'm really excited about, uh, about the whole situation. Um, quick shout out to Jason Samuel, who, uh, who paid for one of these microphones. Woo-hoo. Um, and uh, we, we just want to say thank you on the podcast proper. We talked about him at length in the uncut mm-hmm. episode. But um, thank you to Jason for uh, supporting us in that way. Hearing that, that like our goal was, oh, we want to get two microphones in here. And then being like, I can help you do that right now. Um, and Which that, is just, there's like internet friends that I've yeah. never met helping make my life better, yeah. which is just like such a fun and, and cool and unique concept. Yeah. That- cause, cause if I went out and I spent the, the money on this microphone on one of these microphones that it costs, m- my wife would be like, what are you doing? <laughs> All right. We've got a kid coming. Yeah. We have a million things to pay for. Uh, she's got her eye set on like the basically highest end stroller possible. <laughs> Actually, that's not true. It goes way higher end than what we're getting. But like in terms of like like middle class Vancouver middle, end, middle class <laughs> Vancouver, right? It's like the <laughs> stroller. Um, yeah. Tomorrow morning, I go to pick up my new car. Oh, yeah, I, it's not an exciting. exciting car to most people, oh. but uh, but Is it I electric? got it. It's a Rav Four hybrid. Ooh, yeah, so it's another hybrid. hybrid. Um, nice. If they had a Rav Four full electric, that's what I would get, but they don't make them. I mean, electric. hybrid is still. I'm driving. It's the, better. I have yeah. such a POS car. You <laughs> have a really cool new uh, your your new couch thing too, like your little chair that's for the baby in the room. Yeah, yeah. I want like a room. big. I mean, not for baby, but for like reading. Like I just want yeah. like a big comfy chair for my house. Um, so I come here and I have so much of Mike's reject furniture at my house it's because true. they. Get, I like, tried to send some home with you tonight. <laughs> yeah, you did. <laughs> you said no. I'm not. I'm not taking it. Yeah. I need to stop taking your. Does anybody? Furniture. Does anybody want a Hems coffee table from IKEA? <laughs> I don't need it anymore. Uh, it's the big square one. If you live in Vancouver, I guess. Um, I'm not shipping it anywhere. I yeah no I I. Okay. Yeah, we're almost So you've there, said but... yeah no a couple times, and I just have to say, so I was away last week. 
Yeah. But like it was a, a, a great week for me to be away because it was the actual like planned pause in the podcast, which is great. So it's not like I missed a podcast or anything like that. But I was in France and it was amazing. But it was so, so funny that we had talked about on the podcast Canadianisms. Yeah. And the I'm just sorry, I'm just going to scooch by you or whatever yeah. it is. Or like, sorry, I'm just going to sneak, sneak past, past you. you yeah. And I said it at the airport twice yeah like in the vancouver airport t- before i was leaving and i just i didn't even clock that it's something that just happens all the time and then i said yeah. it a couple times while i was overseas too and it just like was something that was so funny so i just had to say that because the the like yeah no or all right as being a canadianism as well so yeah. it made me remember that and i just thought I'd, i would share that with everybody did i text you i think i texted you when i did it maybe maybe i did because i remember being like oh my god i said this twice i also said gracias Way too many times because I just went, my brain went, you're in a different country. You need to switch into the different country language that you know. But that's, and, but that's wrong. It wrong was the one. wrong. It was the wrong yeah. language. And it was really funny. Amanda spends too much time in Mexican resorts. I do. I do. <laughs> Gracias. <laughs> Cerveza, por favor. <laughs> um, cool. Let's jump into an email. Actually. Oh, yeah. Exciting. Yeah. Uh, cool. I don't have emails on my phone. Yeah. (laughs) Uh, Subject line, Attack of the Clones. Hey, Mike and Amanda, listening to the Attack of the Clones podcast and wanted to share the way that I watch it. Once Anakin and Padme go off on their own, I just skip that chapter. (laughs) So what you get is the Obi-Wan story. Keep up the great work. Looking forward to more podcasts. That's from Ron. Nice. Uh, Thank you, Ron, for uh, confirming that that is the best way to watch Attack of the Clones. (laughs) Uh, yeah, I'm pretty sure that there's a good cut there uh, that you put together. Where, you just like, yeah. yeah, go through. I really, okay, so here's my thing. There's lots of different things that I would like to do in my life and different interesting people that I would like to meet. Yeah. But, like, I really want to meet Toby Maguire for the sole fact. Wait, not Toby Maguire. Hayden Topher, Topher Grace. Who, oh, yeah, because he's Topher got Grace, that, he's because got he's got cut. the cut of Star Wars, yeah. like, the definitive. People are, like, saying it's, like, a definitive pre- prequel cut. Yeah. And I, like, really want to see it. So yeah. I want to make friends with Topher Grace yeah, so that he, I can watch he his He basically cut uh, Attack of the Clones and Revenge of the Sith into one movie, right? Yeah, yeah. And there's like, and he uses and made some them stuff from Phantom yeah. Menace's yeah. flashbacks. Yeah, and it's like, it's supposed to be like a really good yeah. way to tell. Like, I don't know. I've heard yeah. just amazing I, things about it. I, I We didn't talk about this on the Attack of the Clones one. We kind of talked around it, but I never actually said it. But I, in my mind, I've got the cut for Attack of the Clones, like what I talk about. But what my goal would be with the Anakin Padme story is basically you get them cut down a little bit of the weird creepiness uh, a lot of like sort of like the anakin obi-wan talking back and forth about her while she's in the other room is a little bit weird <laughs> you kind of cut that stuff down a little bit trim it to just to move the movie along a bit faster but you do need to keep all of that stuff up until anakin kisses padme right and and she rejects him outright and I think the thing that ruins that is that then you get all of these weird, like, are they romantically involved? Are they not scenes in the middle of it that are just so awkward and weird with like rolling in the grass, the weird <laughs> sexy dinner, the floating fruit dinner. The floating fruit dinner is so weird. It's, it's not even so sexy. Weird. It's a weird dinner. Well, no, there's a, they're, they're, across... those are two different scenes because there's also the sexy one where they're sitting by the fire. Oh, that one. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. There's um, and it's it's all just it's all just kind of weird and awkward and feels really like sort of shoved in there. But the idea is that you cut from their story at the point that that he does that and she rejects him and you don't acknowledge the romantic part of it and you go like that's just something that happened. He did that and she was like no. Gross. <laughs> and then you go through the movie and he goes and he kills the sand people and he doesn't rescue his mom. And he comes back and whatever. And then they go off to rescue Obi-Wan and they're about to be executed in the arena. And she turns to him and goes, I love you. <laughs> I've always loved you. I was just lying before. <laughs> and you go and like, if you do it that way, it's like, then that ends up actually becoming a twist Yeah. at the end. Yeah. Whereas it's kind of like, it's this thing of like, well, obviously we it's, it's going to yeah, build like to something. Weird, yeah. But if you make it a thing that they like, 
Anakin's kind of building up steam and he's like, I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. We're alone and I'm going to kiss her. And then he kisses her and she kind of kisses him back and then goes like, oh no, this is gross. And then, and like, that's what you're thinking in your head. And then at the end when she's like, I love you, you're like, wait, what? Mm -hmm. And then you realize like, oh, they have a really weird dysfunctional relationship, (laughs) which then lends itself to Revenge of the Sith where, uh, there's the conversation they have where she's like, Oh, so you just, you, you're just blinded by love. And he's like, that's not what I said. And it's like, no, but it's true. Yeah. And it's like, yeah, no, the both of you are weird and don't understand how to have meaningful relationships with other human beings or other sentient beings. Cause they're in star Wars. Uh, and that's why, that's why everything goes to hell. That's why their relationship is the reason that the entire or just galaxy make falls apart. A, make make them have chemistry that you ship so hard. Yeah. Like it's just I don't know anybody that ships them. And I mean I'm sure I mean we talked about this before. I'm sure there is. But like the, the, there are lots of Clone thing, Wars fans that do because, because Clone, of the Clone Wars, Wars it does. Yeah, I'm sure it's, in Clone Wars like Clone Wars takes place after they're married, right? Yeah. So it's like they're they're married, but they have a secret relationship that nobody can know about. And that's so fun, there's and there's fun tension, there. and like yeah. it's the best. But Clone like, Wars is the best part of the prequels, hands down. Yeah. And rewatching them and thinking of them critically the way that we did in the last month. Uh, it's just reinforced that that the yeah. Clone Wars is just miles ahead mm-hmm. of of the movies themselves. Yeah, but you like have to you have to at a certain point just like take the movies for what they are and for just, sure. Yeah, I don't yeah. know. Yeah, it's just a little um, a little devastating. But we're gonna get into stuff. the next Star yeah. Wars movie at the end of this episode. Yeah, talk about A New Hope. But before we do that. Uh, let's just let's just touch on a couple of pieces of news. Um, there's it. It was kind of weird, even though we took that week off. I don't really feel like there was a lot. Um, it was E3 this past week, um, so there's some video game news. Uh, but I don't, I don't. That doesn't. Really, there, there are definitely people in our audience that play video games, mm-hmm. but you don't play video games, so it's kind of pointless. No, I'll just end really up talking know, the whole no, time. No, a ton of things. But there's some cool stuff coming out. There's some cool stuff with like cloud-based gaming consoles. So instead mm-hmm. of having a physical console, now you have just the controller, and you could play through your Chrome browser, um, that's stuff cool. like that. That's really I neat. like that. Really low barrier to entry stuff. So that's um, what I need because the moment that absolutely. things become complicated for me, it just like. Yeah. It's like a further reason for me to not play video games. But yeah. You make it um, easy. So, yeah. So, there's some cool stuff. I, I, it was announced over the break that um, Tom Holland will be playing Nathan Drake in yeah, the Uncharted I saw that. movie, mm-hmm, which mm-hmm. is really cool. That's really exciting. I love yeah. Tom Holland. I am a huge fan of the Uncharted series. Uncharted is probably my favorite video game series. It's kind of hard to gauge. Video games, it's You've really hard to... You've talked about it a lot. Con- Didn't you, like, you were him for Halloween one year, I feel? Uh, no, I've always wanted to, but I need the holsters. I need the, the rest of the outfit. Oh. Um, I have the rest of the costume, except for that part. Okay. Uh, but, uh, yeah, no, I, I I love that character uh, made famous by uh, Nolan North, um, the voice of Nolan North, and then the digital character avatar. I don't know who Nolan North is. He's a voice actor, and okay. he's you do know who Nolan North is. You uh, just don't. actually did you watch Pretty Little Liars? No. No. Okay. The, which is a show that's kind of up it's, your alley. It is. I understand Surprising that, that I should. I'm surprised. It. He's actually he's actually one of the dads on that. Oh, um, interesting. I, he, I feel like I should watch Pretty Little. He's Liars. in a bunch of stuff, and yeah. you would actually did you watch Young Justice? Uh, parts of it. Yeah. So he's Superboy. Oh, okay. He's Superboy and okay. Superman. Cool. Yeah, he's the voice of both of them. I cool. uh, yeah, no, Nolan North is is probably one of the best voice actors. He's definitely one of the best voice actors nice. in the world. Um he is my favorite voice actor, uh in in large part due to the fact that he's Nathan Drake. Um but yeah, I Tom Holland is Nathan. Tom Holland's cool. gonna be playing Nathan Drake in the movie. Uh, which means that it's obviously going to be a much younger Nathan Drake. Mm-hmm. Um, in the video games, we've seen Nathan when he's a very young teenager, and we've seen him when he's an adult, but we haven't seen that period in between, sort of that 20s area, and that's, I think, what these movies will focus on. Which is interesting. Cool. Um, so that's cool. Uh, it'll basically be a kind of young Indiana Jones type of thing. Yeah. If they do it right, it'll be great. If they don't, it'll be another video game movie that's not very good. 
Um, I've, isn't Resident Evil like the only one that's been relatively good? Like yes, but one? in a very like campy genre way. Yeah. And the other part of that is that the Resident Evil movies are not the Resident Evil games, oh, okay. right? Like they are very, very different. From and I'm the not story using the Resident games. Evil movies. Yeah. I just mean the first the one first was one. a lot of fun. But it could just be because I really like Mila Djokovic because uh, the Fifth Element was like my favorite movie as a kid. Yeah, so. Yeah. Um, ah, and made it so much more devastating that that stupid thousand planets of a whatever was Valerian. so terrible. Yeah, yeah, Valerian. Yeah. And yeah. It's uh, so bad. I don't know I if people have seen it, it but, but oh my God. But it's beautiful. It's a yeah. beautiful disaster. In the same way that Jupiter Ascending is such a yeah. beautiful movie. Like the, the effects budget. Like they just didn't skimp, but it's like you Those can't. Those like the you dragon. Can't put, the dragon alien like, guy I don't know, in Jupiter you just Ascending can't, is so The good. more VFX you put on a piece yeah. of garbage the weirder it becomes because you're like, you spent so much yeah. time on this, the f- but the f- it just doesn't work for the, the story. The phrase is that you can't shine a turd. Well, yes. Yeah. I mean, that's... Uh, but you but you got so close. Because yeah. the thing is with Valyrian and the City of a Thousand Planets or whatever it is, it's almost worth watching for the VFX alone because it is yeah. quite beautiful. And the basic concept is fine. It's just that, like, speaking of, it's, like, worse than Amidala and... uh and Anakin, Anakin in terms yeah. of the chemistry between the two yeah, of them. Yeah, like yeah. it's atrocious. Well, when you take two actors who are very well known for being sort of like aloof and aloof like, and, yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> Standoffish. Yeah. And put them it's, together. Yeah, it's like, like, well, maybe it'll work if we put them together. Nope. It doesn't work. <laughs> no, that doesn't work at all. Uh, yeah. Like it's crazy. Um, oh, I just, okay. So I was away for a week. Yeah. And in my head, I just have to like get it out because it's in my brain, but I read, two novels over the break while I was like oh wait actually I read a couple but but the it's um the I think I've talked about it before the series by Marissa Meyer which was like the Cinderella and like Rapunzel and all that stuff but like like as cyborgs and like in this in space and like sci-fi okay. versions of these oh my gosh it's yeah. such a great YA series I love it so it finished a while ago and then she came up with this new series called Renegades that I hadn't read um, so it was Renegades and Arch Enemies. And then I was like, well, whatever. I might just get it from the library. And so I did. And the book came through the day that I left for France. And then I finished my book that I was reading in Paris called Paris Letters, which was lovely about how to leave your life and go live in Paris. It was wonderful. Um, but then I was like, I'll just read this book. And it's about, it's like, it's told through the eyes of like the villain. It was, it's really cool. It's like, it's about superheroes and stuff. So I feel like it's in the same, like, genre and i feel like that's why i'm bringing it up on this podcast Mm -hmm. but i'm just like in terms of like it's the story that's in my head right now so it's coloring everything that i'm seeing and like hearing and talking about so us just talking about like bad chemistry versus good chemistry and it's just like it's a book and it's like you can only write characters so much but you can like you can write good chemistry like it's hard to Mm -hmm. it's hard to mess that up and when you like see a script that you're kind of like this was obviously like written in a way that makes it flat, but you can find a way to have characters that like resonate and relate and, and are excited about one another. But anyways, it's a pretty cool concept for a book. It's a, uh, um, but yeah, it's about basically it's like the, the hero, the heroine of the book is actually the niece of the, of the villain. And yeah. it's like a cool, like she infiltrates the heroes and of course falls in love with the, the son of the <laughs> Superman or whatever. Of course. But it's like the best. I'll but take your word for it. I just don't understand how after two. Let me know when they through. adapt it into a show. I will because I'm like surely someone is yeah. going to do it soon. So um, yeah. But anyways, the only reason I had to say that content. out loud is because it's in my head. So every time we're talking about stuff, I'm thinking yeah. about that because in the way that really good stories stick with you for a while. So. Um, well, speaking of good stories with bad chemistry, sometimes I uh, it was announced. What was it yesterday? I think. That uh, in 2020, we're going to get a prequel novel to The Hunger Games. Ugh, Did you who hear needs, about this? Who asked for that? <laughs> Everybody. <What>? Everybody. <laughs> no, that's exactly no, it. No, I didn't hear about Hunger that. Games is gone from the public consciousness, yeah. right? Like, it's like it's done. Yeah. Uh, and, it had its uh, and obviously, Made Suzanne Collins is recognizing that reality because her pocketbook is probably starting to, to uh, empty out. And uh, and so she's decided that she's going to write uh, a prequel novel that takes place. I think it's sixty years before the Hunger yeah. Games. Um, now here's the thing: there's a lot of world building questions that we have had in the past about Hunger Games. Yeah, that's we've fair. talked about a lot on Quiver. For example, what happens above the forty ninth parallel? 
Because, yeah, yeah, yeah. Where's Canada, man? Yeah, because you look at the map uh, of Pan Am and it just stops where Canada starts. And I uh, and and we've always posited that like Canada's fine. Yeah, we just we're just chilling. Whatever happened in the states <laughs> happened in the states, and it's just like all gone to crap. But that like Canada is like there's like a big wall, yeah. and it's like well they built their wall, I guess. We'll just keep keep living uh, up here. Yep. There's nothing we can do about it. They yep. they built a big wall. Yep. We we can't, we can't get Let's in there. Let's just start trading with Europe more and the Pacific North, like the Pacific Rim. Like yeah. we'll we'll figure it out. Yeah. So it's like the rest of the world is mostly okay. It's just uh, Pan Am that has decided that sacrificing children is the way to uh, to maintain peace. Um, but yeah, I I would love it if this series focuses less on Pan Am and more on the world, like what happened at large. And, yeah, yeah, and what happened. Um, but something tells me it's gonna focus an awful lot on a young woman and her relationship with two young men at the same time. Um, what? Yeah. that's not a trope that exists in YA novels. No, not at all. Uh, it is. I have to say, one of my favorite tropes. <laughs> Uh yeah, so I don't know. We'll we'll see. We'll see what it ends up being. Um it it'll what it what Hunger Games is it in the it's the sixty fifth. The quarter right? well. So it's the seventy fifth, I thought. The seventy fifth. Yeah. So if it's sixty years before, there's it's there's been fifteen been years. Fifteen years of yeah. of Hunger Games. Yeah. So uh It'll the probably be one, a fifteen year old girl. The one bright spot mm-hmm. in in this concept is that um, unlike the last book, there will actually be Hunger Games in this Hunger Games story. Yes. Um, and that's kind of, I mean, like, as much as we're making fun of, it, like, all oh, America goes to hell and sacrifices teenagers, that's what we want to see from that series. And in the third book, uh, especially in the film adaptations of the it. The film adaptation, they didn't get across the idea that it is a Hunger Game. Yeah. The, like, yeah, the, the, the last, the, the, the last like, chapter, yeah. like, the last third of the book is a is a hunger hunger game yeah yeah uh yeah so i hopefully hopefully we'll we'll get a little bit more focused on that and we'll it'll do the same thing that the first two books did which is introduce us to a cast of characters make us fall in love with the good guys and the bad guys and then see how that plays out and how they come together or don't yeah right and uh and and which small child will die that we'll all be really sad about yeah um, yeah, it's actually it's actually really easy to manipulate an audience in yeah. a story like that because you just go like, oh, look at this cute little girl who's yeah. good at climbing things. Yeah, I'm going to kill her. Can I just say <laughs> that actress, the one that played Rue, yeah. has been in like three blockbuster movies over the last year that all did terribly. And oh, really? it really sucks because she does such a good job and the 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 adaptations that she's in are so good. But I don't think they've been getting the like getting off the ground in the way that they were supposed to. Yeah. Like one of them is a dystopian series by Ale- Alexa Alexander Bracken, and I can't for the life of me I can remember the author's name, but I can't remember what the series is called. But it's basically just about these like kids that are like colored, like they um they like are orange or green or like blue based on the level of their threat because the kids basically. It turns out, spoiler alert, that by drinking like contaminated water, all the kids in America have been given superpowers, basically. Okay. And then they kill all the really like powerful kids, and then they just enslave the rest. So it's yeah. this really interesting sort of weird novel concept. But she's she's the lead in that adaptation. It's a four book adaptation. It got the one movie, Darkest Minds. That's what it's called. Okay. The Darkest Minds. There was a movie that came out about it. Like I was I was like the target demographic for that, and I didn't realize there was a movie out for it <laughs> until it was already out. The Sun is Also a Star is another YA movie that she just came out with, yeah. which is a beautiful book. It's just, I can't wait to watch the movie. But again, I don't think it did that well because I haven't heard that much about it. Oh, but that's I'm the also one with the, the guy from Riverdale, right? I think so, yeah. Because it's basically, it's about a Korean American and uh, a Jamaican immigrant. Uh, or I guess she's getting, like, her family she, is her getting, getting deported. deported yeah. And it's what's the day that they spent together. Um, and... It's just, it's a beautiful book and I really want to see the movie. Yeah. But again, I don't know if it did that well. And then the third thing is uh, is Thug, um, The Hate You Give. She was in that adaptation as well, um, which I watched on the plane and then cried. I I feel so bad for the person that was beside me. I like cried watching every single movie that I was like, well, I could have just been the jet lag. But it's a great movie. But again, it's a, it's such a true adaptation of the book. But the mm. problem is sometimes you have to not truly adapt stuff so that it works for like... 
But if you like stick through it, it's like a beautiful, you know, but I just, that actress like had all these opportunities to become like great. Mm. And I, I don't know her name. And that's the thing with like get people that are given opportunities. But anyways, yeah. But Little Rue, if you want to see Little Rue and different things, those are three movies that came out over the like the last like. So they're available. That, like, the Sun platforms. is also a star. It the trailer came out and it was like, oh, is this a Netflix movie? Oh, this is a theatrical release. Yeah. No one's gonna see this in the theater. Yeah. Because I, uh, I, Crystal and I watched I, uh, I, uh, Always Be My Maybe. Oh yeah, nice. Uh, on the weekend and. Uh, Spoiler alert for that one. It's fantastic. Yeah. It's a great rom com. Right? Like so fun. perfect. So like fun. a like a, 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 a an absolutely perfectly executed. Netflix nails the rom coms, man. Um yeah, and and what's even better about it is that it's it's an Asian American cast. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, at least the the two leads are Asian American, and then it's there's a lot of uh, not white people. Yeah, it's great <laughs> in it. Um, it's really cool because it actually looks like reality. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, but on top of that, it's also very funny people mm-hmm. with great chemistry mm-hmm. doing a really great job. Um, and uh, and we should definitely do a yeah. a thunder quack yeah. reviewed for right. it. Um, but yeah, it's, it's like the sun is also a star. looks like a very saccharine, uh, it would do really uh, well on Netflix. Yeah. Yeah. yeah but like, it's it, just like, but yeah. it, it's, it's like, I'm not going to pay the $15 to go to the movie theater to see a movie like that when I can watch. But it could be, be that like the demographic I think they were trying to get are the like teens that would have gone to the movies, but I don't yeah. think they did the proper marketing campaign for something like that. And so it's just like it really sucks because I want stuff like that to do really well, I don't, and I want I don't to be think able to that those people. teens exist anymore. Yeah, I don't like I don't, like, I don't think like, that that demographic them. is yeah. a thing. Yeah. At this point, I mean, when I when I talk to teenagers these days, mm-hmm. they 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 tend to be watching things online. Um, and and here's the other thing, you put a movie in the theater, they're not gonna go to the theater. They're gonna pirate it yeah. because yeah. they know how to, and they don't necessarily have the moral compass. And I mean, like there are a lot of adults who are also pirating a no, lot of stuff. Uh, yes, but they but teenagers certainly don't have the moral compass, and they also don't have it's a it's a lack of opportunity thing, yeah. right? They don't have the disposable income to spend fifteen dollars on a movie. Yeah. They've either got to work and then they don't have time because they also have school, or they have to get their money from their parents. And yeah. you know, so I think like you're really limiting your audience if that's who you're going for. But I, yeah. it's a yeah, it it just felt weird. It just felt off. It felt kind of tone deaf to today's distribution so model. Right. Okay. So this is a perfect segue to the fact that I was away for a week at this yeah. animation it's festival. It's never a perfect talked- segue if you say perfect segue. You know what? How many times have we talked about this? Yeah. Don't point out. Yeah. Whatever. Whatever. Fine. You ruined it. I don't even want to talk about it now. No. It's no, a perfect space. segue Fine. to the animation festival you were at. Because the, the panels that I was the most interested in are stuff, again, using the word innovation that I don't think they really understand what innovation is. But I'm always interested because I'm I, one day I, I believe that I will get to go to a panel where they actually use the word innovation correctly. Mm-hmm. But basically it was how to get audiences into movie theaters. And can I just say that when I go into a thing and they say, uh, don't worry, Netflix will never kill theaters i'm like wait why are you sitting on this panel because like everybody's like afraid they're like what are you like what are you gonna do now that netflix is around and it's like well you have to adapt to it you can't just like sit there with blinders on being like well like nothing's killed the theater so far and i mean the problem with that is that like as a theater major from university i agree with that a little bit like theater's been around for 2000 years and we find ways to tell stories in communal ways and and having live audiences experiences Mm -hmm. and i believe that that is has longevity and i think that there's something to that but you can't ignore that in distribution models when you're looking at how to market and manage film distribution to people and so it's very much like that that i'm watching all these like old people that are running these studios and running these marketing models trying to think of new ways to innovate i'm using my air quotey things here about getting people into theaters and really they're not doing anything innovation innovative they're just trying to figure out how to market things differently yeah. and i'm like that's not that's not really what we need we really need to figure out like what it is it, are these theater models like how do we adapt yeah. these theater models to make them work in a in an interesting way but i say that and then this idea of going into a theater i'm not a mo- like i don't i didn't get into animation because i'm one of those kids that grew up and was like i always wanted to do animation animation is my heart and soul and i just love everything animated i got into it because i went into like 
storytelling in different mediums and yeah. was a producer and got a job in animation and now I'm in animation but I was there with people that love animation and that's their passion and that always had been since they were a little kid they wanted to make animation so going and watching movies with people that just have a reverence for the art form is just so amazing and you start to get an appreciation for it too and I don't go to movies by myself but when you're at a conference and you have passes you go and you see all these things by yourself because you get into the really yeah. like exciting so showings and there's two that I want to talk about on this because they're going to be coming out soon I'm hoping but they're international movies so we'll see but the one that was like absolutely devastating was called The Swallows of Kabul and it's a French film um, and it's an adaptation of a book um, but basically it takes place in the Afghanistan, like the Taliban ruled Afghanistan. And it show it's the story of these two couples, like one older uh, couple and one younger couple and the younger couple being like had been professors at university. And like, she's just stuck inside and refuses to like own a burqa because it's just like, there's all this, it's just, it's just a harrowing and it's like, it's like water, it's like paint on paper like it's mm. this beautiful stylized thing and it has these two female directors and it just like I I was like sobbing in the theater that it was just so like incredibly exciting and touching and it's it's uh it's one of the ones that was getting some buzz at cans as well um and so that one highly recommend if you have a chance to see the swallows of Kabul and then the second one that was also getting a lot of buzz and this is the one that wound up winning the festival like it won the crystal is the is the award uh, the festival is called I Lost My Body or J perdu mon corps um which is about a severed hand that goes through the city to find its body and in doing so you you get the story of the guy's life like it sort of mm. goes through like all of the experiences that he had and the reason i end with that one is because that you know like you know the movie's about a severed hand it starts with you see the hand severed and you see the guy and you figure out about like you know two quarters a quarter of the way through, you realize how he's going to lose his hand. Like you sort of like you get enough hints like they're they're starting to give it. So you get enough hints. So then when it start when it comes up, when you get to the scene where you know he's going to lose his hand, there's just something indescribable. But being in that theater with all those people and everybody just being like, <gasps> <gasps> Yeah. Like all together. And you experience this story communally. And so when we talk about storytelling and like mediums to to get places that was the one thing being there and being all cynical and going to these things being like you don't know what innovation is and like netflix is the way of it and then being there with these people that have this this people were lining up for two hours to get into this screening like i had been refreshing my feed all day to try to get a ticket to it wound up getting one that thought that i was on top of the world wound up getting like a great great seat to it and just being there and 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 just experiencing it with all those people there is really something to that which is really really awesome and so it just yeah it just was like a really cool experience i think so. i think what's going to happen is that and it's already happening you can you can look at what the highest grossing box office draws are every year um obviously it's marvel movies yeah. uh but star wars is up there as well um the harry potter movies even if they're terrible and controversial still seem to do pretty good um it's spectacle and it's uh big budget and it's mm -hmm. movie stars that pull people out of their uh netflix amazon prime youtube streaming cocoon yeah. to go out into the world and and enjoy something uh as a as a community and this is one of those things where it's like whenever somebody tells or says to me I know you're going to you're going to be so mad at me because yeah. everybody knows that I'm a Star Wars fan. They know that I love Marvel movies or whatever. Oh, you're going to be so mad at me. I haven't seen blank. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And my response for the last few years has always been, I'm not mad at you. Yeah, like, Why would I be yeah. mad at you? I feel sorry for you <laughs> because these movies are an incredible experience. Um, and if you go into a movie theater with the express intent of not having a good time, that's your problem. Yeah. That has nothing to do with me. So one of the things is that w one of the people that, I, that I've that i been seeing Marvel and Star Wars movies with, a, a good friend of mine, Jeff, over the last couple of years, I've noticed that 
as I've grown more positive about these movies, he seems to be going in the other direction where he's kind of getting a little bit cantankerous and yeah, a little yeah. bit. And it's this funny thing that happens as as we get older. And he's a couple years older than me as well, so he's kind of he's kind of a few years ahead in in this development. Um, but you start looking at the way things are done now and getting grumbly and um, upset about it, and I. I, it's not as much fun going to the movies with them anymore. Right. And and it's it's such a bummer because we used to have these great experiences where we'd walk out of the theater and be like, oh, man, I love that. I love this part. Oh, what did you like? I like this part. Oh, that was cool. It was great. What do you think is going to happen in this? And the, the post credit scene, it's implying this. And do you know anything about this character? And sort of sharing that experience. And now the last couple of times we've gone together, which actually hasn't been that much lately, come out of the movie and it's like, so what did you think? So uh, it was okay, I guess. Right. And then the conversation is over. Yeah. And it's like, okay, well, I guess I'll see you at the next one. And and um, sort of the flip of that is that Crystal and I went with one of her friends who doesn't have a group like that to go to movies with. And uh, she really wanted to go see Endgame a second time, wanted to see it in IMAX, and so did we because we didn't get to see it in IMAX on opening. Um, and so it was my third viewing. We would go to see it in IMAX. And I, because we'd already seen it and it had been like a month since the movie had come out, I, we were talking about it at dinner beforehand and getting excited about it. We'd go into the movie. Uh, we've seen it already, so we know all the parts to get excited and hyped for. I've yeah. seen it twice al- at this yeah, point yeah. already. This is my third time in it, Crystal's second time, and Morgan's second time. And uh, and so it's like, you know, you're like ramping up to the good parts, getting so excited. And in IMAX, that movie is emotional right like yeah, the cool like stuff, stuff thinking yeah. about it right now it's like i get like i get tinglys thinking about it in imax um it's such a great film i uh, and i uh, and it's cooler because we were we all wanted to be there and we all wanted to be excited about yeah. it yeah and i think that that's sort of what the communal experience is becoming and the smaller stories and the the, the smaller productions have a place on streaming services and you can watch them at home and or it's festivals like or that festivals. idea of finding people and that, that, was what that I was finding say. your audience that Co- genuinely, festivals and yeah. conventions i think are going to become a place where people come together and they and they can appreciate these things mm-hmm. in, or like single groups, but, single single uh screen theaters yeah. that are really like specialized so and you have, yeah in north america especially in the states along the coast i think that we've seen a lot of development of these sort of um, boutique theaters mm-hmm. like Alamo draft houses and, and, and theaters like that. And we've got up here with Cineplex, we've got the VIP, uh, stuff, which is, you know, it's, it's fine. It's definitely a corporate version of that. Um, it's not quite as much of a, like a catered experience. Like the uh, Rio is the experience. Well, really. the Rio is like the real thing, but the Rio yeah. is also lo-fi. Yeah. Well, right. Yeah. So like the Alamo draft house, if you don't know is like, they are some of the best theaters. Like they've got state of the art projection and sound and all that stuff. But then you go in and like the seats are sometimes with some of them. Cause each one's kind of a little bit different with some of them. It's like the, the seats are basically like love seats that they've like pulled in. Yeah, right. And like, cool. they might yeah. not all match and they're kind of, it's yeah. kind of your own thing. Um, and you like you can get service during the middle of the movie at, at Alamo, not just at the beginning, like with the VIP Like ones. Gilmore Girls? Yes. Like the little movie theater that they have in there? Kind of, yeah. Um, yeah, so I, I think that we'll move more towards something like that, that will make f- movie going uh, more of an experience. Um, and Which I is think- not 4D. It's not 4D no, kind not of experience. 4D, no. It's it's the opposite. And so that's kind of the interesting thing well, when like, you talk well, about Well, look what's happening with 3D. 3D is right? going away It now, is because right? people don't want that. And the idea of these big spectacle things, I think what you're saying is exactly right. Rethinking what it is. You're not going to draw in these huge audiences. You're going to try to get these smaller communal experiences yeah. where people want to be there because of the people that they're with. Yeah. I think think of it in terms of, of sort of like ancient theater and entertainment if you think of it like 
the small movies that are on Netflix are like little stages with mm. with like three actors, yeah. right? Doing whatever play, um, like yeah, like Greek play, and then the Colosseum. That's the Marvel movies and the Star Wars yeah. movies where everybody is there, yeah. right? And it's, it's for the spectacle. It's not for the it's story. for the spectacle, and yeah. it's definitely a little bit more uh, not for the common denominator because I think that the Marvel movies have become pretty sophisticated in the last couple of years. Um, Endgame certainly is not a simple movie. It's not a lowest common denominator movie. It's like they're talking about quantum physics like it's not that big a deal. Yeah, um, but it's like it's it's big enough that it's like people can Oh, for sure. Yeah, you yeah. you you, yeah, you could close, not yeah. really understand it and still enjoy it, but the majority of people that I've noticed uh not liking Endgame, they're like, "Well, time travel doesn't make any sense in that movie." It's like, "Well, you don't understand quantum physics then i uh, because they explain it perfectly <laughs> or in the movie. also time travel doesn't make sense in that movie because it makes perfect sense mm-hmm. all right it makes the only kind of sense that it can make i i guess i mean that's you're not wrong because otherwise it's back to the future rules in which case all you're doing is creating paradoxes yeah, yeah. like the like paradoxes. the time travel that they put forward in endgame is the only version of time travel that doesn't create paradoxes right it's it's the bill and ted version of time travel uh we can't find the keys but when we get the keys in the future we'll just put the keys back in this place and then we'll have the keys now okay okay hey, well, look, that's a little bit different that's no a, that's exactly the same that's not the same as, like, as endgame let's take let's take this uh tesseract and then put it back exactly where we got it <laughs> no that's not the same thing at all okay no because they can't <laughs> they can't affect the timeline yeah I know. the the bill and ted time travel posits that like you i'm gonna go back like after we win i'm gonna go back and i'm gonna change the timeline before right now altering now right like in in the the marvel time travel they go back they take the tesseract from 1970 it doesn't affect their timeline they go back to where they were yeah right so that's totally that's the opposite it's not the same i it's more the idea of the like putting stuff back where you like conveniently took it from i don't know it's just a weird i don't know time travel because it's it's like the bee in my bonnet the only good time travel that has ever been good is terminator that's the only good time travel just the first movie it's it's like the perfect it's like it's like perfect time travel what what makes it what tell me what makes terminator perfect time travel it actually it's perfect because there was a terminator dark fate trailer that came out since the last time we talked but what makes terminator perfect time travel because it's the thing that happens because it happens like terminator the terminator exists because that's not the first terminator movie though yes that the terminator goes back and finds sarah connor because Sarah Connor gets cre- pregnant with John Carter or whatever, or John John Connor, John, John Connor, yeah. And the only way that that happens is if Terminator comes back, and and hunts Sarah okay. Car- Con- yeah. It's Connor. a closed loop. It's a closed loop. Yeah. It's perfect. Okay, I get what you're saying there, but the yeah, okay, it, yeah, it happens because it happens is a little bit more of a T two idea. I guess like they so, talk but about it more. Yeah, they don't they, talk about the time travel very much at yeah, all. Yeah, because in the but first T2 Terminator. starts to make it a little bit more complicated. Yeah. But so that but that's just why I like T1 is because it's a yeah. thing that was always supposed to happen. And that's the biggest thing for time yeah. travel for me is that the only kind of good time travel is the kind that always was supposed to happen. Yeah. So it it happens because it happened. That's the like that's the, can the I, logic. Can I can I break Terminator for you? I mean whatever. So one of the prevailing fan theories is that John Connor is a, it's a title, right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah. That there was never actually a John Connor in the first place, but the story became so big in order to unite humanity to fight the machines. And then the machines not understanding metaphor because they're machines took it literally and went, well, if John Connor is the leader of the resistance now and he is around this age, that means that if we go back to this time period and we so find yeah, John, John Connor, Connor. Yeah. in this area, we will be destroying yeah. their leader, yeah. which is the reason why every time they go back and try and whatever they and and like like the idea here is that 
they 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 actually must have been successful at some point because they keep doing it right Mm -hmm. and it they're machines it's trial and error sooner or later the machines are gonna figure out how to kill john connor yeah right whether it's going back and killing sarah connor when she's a child or whatever right like they're gonna figure it out but the reason why it never works is because they never killed John Connor because John Connor was never John Connor to begin with. Yeah. He's somebody else. That's just the least interesting way of viewing Terminator. But, ex- but, but it doesn't break. I don't. Me. I don't think it is the least interesting because the thing is that like that means that that John Connor, the actual one from the future, let's say the Christian Bale one for the, this yeah. argument, although that movie is terrible. <laughs> but let's say the Christian Bale John Connor from Terminator Salvation, he is actually bill mccormick right yeah right yeah but he tells everybody that he's john connor because the robots have time travel yeah (laughs) and the only defense against robots with time travel is to lie is to murder a bunch of children (laughs) named john connor by telling the robots that that's your name (laughs) so they'll never know that he's bill mccormick so they'll never go back and kill bill mccormick yeah or Bill McCormick's mom and dad (laughs) and grandparents because like at a certain point the robots go like well, if we go back to 1812 <laughs> and we do this, yeah, yeah. then none of this happened, yes, right? Like yeah. it's yeah, it, it, but it I mean like it all it's all kind of dumb because uh, except for the first movie like you say because if it's not a closed loop, then it it's a paradox like thing, because yeah, you go back like and that's why that's why I also like Endgame because Endgame it's not a closed loop. It just implies that the back to the future method of if you change the past, you'll cease to exist. That's impossible, right? Because you exist because you went yeah, back. Yeah, you exist yeah. because you went back. And it's like the past is now yeah. your present. So yeah. you can't cease to exist. You're there, yeah. Yeah. right? Um, but the thing about the, the MCU version is that it also implies that each individual human being has a timeline. Every every living thing has a timeline because, if you, in fact, not even every living thing, every atom has its own timeline which that's now we're getting into kind of grant morrison territory and I'll, I'll leave it to him if you've ever heard grant morrison talk about time travel theory like he has some crazy ideas so one of the things he says is that is that human beings think of ourselves as this mm-hmm. like this construct the physical flesh construct but that's because we think of ourselves in 3d because that's how we perceive oh, but if you perceived yeah. 4d we're actually like these giant snake like things Interesting. because yeah. if you think of yourself as a 4d model you're yourself here now but also when you get up and go to the washroom and then come back and then go get something to eat and so you're actually this like this this like game of snake yeah. right that just yeah. kind of like moves Follows around itself. yeah yeah, yeah. So it's it like he talks about that sort of idea and it's like in that idea every person is their own timeline and whatever. Of all it's, the it's like, kind of crazy. I have certain movie moments that have yeah. like stuck with me forever and just the way I watched Interstellar was like after I was like it was my first commercial gig ever so mm-hmm. I was working 16 hour days and yeah. I had one day off in the middle of this like 14 day run. And I got home and I was so exhausted and I ordered two whole pizzas and chicken to myself and set up a little nest (laughs) in my, it was amazing. I set up this little nest and then just let myself watch Interstellar Mm -hmm. and just absorb the whole impact of, and just like bald. And it was like this perfect storytelling experience that I refused to rewatch Interstellar because it was such a great like I just retain so much yeah, of that, that movie. Like it's it's a thing where it's like I yeah. know objectively that I don't think it's as good a it's movie as good. I because yeah. it was just the way that I watched it. Yeah. Made such it's a difference. The, it it is it is 100% the Chris Nolan thing and if you can get into a Christopher Nolan film and enjoy it on your first viewing Okay, good. Never yeah. touch it again. Yeah, that's. I think it's like that's the really Prestige. Yeah. I love the Prestige. I think that it's it, that's his best it's movie. A great movie. Yeah. Um, I've only ever seen it once, and I'll never see it again because yeah. if I watch it again, I'm gonna see the seams. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Because the way that he makes movies, it's it it's it, 
the I've talked about this before. The Prestige is his thesis on filmmaking in the same way that Star Wars is George Lucas's. So you watch the first Star Wars, which we're about to get to, and you see like, oh, this is how George Lucas constructs constructs a story based on you know the the hero with a thousand faces the the joseph campbell monomyth, uh, yeah. monomyth and then you you look at every other one of his movies and you and it and it fits perfectly on every single one of his movies right that same monomyth um and then with christopher nolan it's the same thing you look at the prestige and then you look back at all of his other movies and you go there's a twist in all of his movies right like there's a yeah. like there's a there's moment something, yeah and that moment is the prestige. Like yeah. that's he explains it in the prestige. Like the character in the movie explains what the prestige is, and that's exactly what he's doing in every single one of his films. It's all misdirect, 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 and it's it, every one of his movies gets bigger and bigger because the spectacle has to get bigger because he has to. The trick is going to be bigger mm-hmm. every time. Mm-hmm. So, the Dark Knight is the easiest example to explain. And it's the music in The Dark Knight. Oh, yeah. The the music in The Dark Knight. There's a lot of movies that really effectively use score and lack of score in order to underscore moments. Um, Star Wars is actually really good at it where the music drops out. Empire Strikes Back is a really great example of a lot of scenes where you think that there's great music. The duel between Luke and Vader, there's no score at the beginning of that fight and there's no score at the end of that fight it's That's basically cool. silent the whole time that they're fighting we cut between them fighting and and leia trying to rescue uh han and there's score in that but the like it's so it it kind of like we get the lofty blah 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 with those yeah. characters and then you cut back and it's like there's nothing oh, i'm so excited to watch jedi. to watch empire and jedi oh yeah, yeah. So it only good. gets better yeah. it only gets better as we go um but the Dark Knight, the whole thing is that the music starts at the beginning of that movie and it doesn't stop. It's relentless throughout that film. The only time that the score really stops, there's a few points where it stops, but um, a, a lot of the points where the music stops is because there's there's in-universe music going on. So right. when they're at the dinner, there's, there's music That's in the background yeah, there. Yeah. So there's not a score underneath that. Yeah. But... Anytime he's in the suit, it's going dun it, dun it, dun it, dun it, dun it. And it's like, it's literally the shark from Jaws for two hours. And it's like, Jaws is another great example of a movie that, like, there's no score in a lot of that movie. And then when you hear dun it, dun it, dun it, you know, like, something's about to happen. Right. And, and Dark Knight plays on that fact and just the whole time. It's like there's a shark. Yeah. The whole movie. And w- because that's happening, you don't notice the fact that you're like, man, the Joker could show up at any time and kill anybody and there are no rules and he's chaos and blah, blah, blah. So you never stop and go, how does he know to yeah. do any of this? Yeah. How does he know where to be? Yeah. And we never get any of those answers. It's never explained. He just does because he's not a character. He's a force of nature. Yeah. Right. And like, that's fine. It's the story. And uh, there was a point in time where I was like, Dark Knight's a stupid movie because of that. But it's just, it's not even that. It's now just that, like, th- that's the seam. I can, yeah. I can see the strings on the spaceship. Right. right yeah. And so now the spaceship is not as magical to me. Yeah. Right. But anyways. keep the magic. Only yeah. watch it once. Only watch a Christopher Nolan movie yeah. once and then walk away. Which I will say Although I'm never gonna watch of... Dunkirk because I have no interest, but But the but the all of this is suffice to say it's a little sad for me to come back to Star Wars and start to see the seams a little bit. If we want to like Yeah. I don't know, I'm wearing my Star Wars scarf, by the way. Yeah. It's a great you know, scarf. It's, it's great? got the crawl on the it. The crawl on it. I love uh, it. Yeah. Um, it's well, definitely a stealth scarf because it's so like you definitely don't know what it is. You have to know, know what, what it is. is. Yeah, yeah. Um, but like Star Wars is a really old movie. <laughs> yeah. And here's the problem. It's a very slow paced film. I watched the Blu-rays, so yeah. there's also Jabba in it. Yeah. Which is just why. Also, even if you're gonna have that scene in it, why keep the moment where he goes, "You're such a great human being." 
Why not just cut it as he's walking away? What is the point of keeping that line in? It's a funny line. That's oh, stupid. J- he's Jabba. You're a wonderful human being. He's not a human being. He's a disgusting slug monster. Well, whatever. He's being, as Han Solo is being a jerk. Anyways. He, Jabba was just like, if you don't do what I say, I'm going to kill you. I can kill you right now. All there's, I've got like 15 guys. <laughs> Boba Fett's here. We're not even going to draw attention to the fact that Boba Fett's here. Mostly because he wasn't a character yet, but yeah. it was just another background character. Yeah. But uh, yeah, Boba Fett's here, and like along with all of these other guys, and Greedo, who you just killed, is standing right there. <laughs> um, there, that that scene should be recut out of the movie. Um, yeah. It's yeah, the special editions are a difficult thing. Uh, what I'll say is, A New Hope suffers the most from the special edition. Um, there's a lot of stuff in there that distracts from the movie yeah i when we get into empire and jedi in empire you won't even notice what the special yeah you don't you don't i i definitely understand so the main things in empire are the wampa we get more scenes with the wampa and then cloud city is expanded and and a lot more convincing um as a location and if you go back and you watch the original footage like it justifies the special edition existing. It justifies everything dumb that was done yeah. in a new hope. Yeah. A new hope, unfortunately, because it was George's first movie and it was the one that he had the least control over right. in, not in terms of, I mean, like he had a lot of creative control over all three, but it's the one that he had the least ability to, to realize his vision. Yeah. Right. So it's the one that he goes back and he messes with the most. Yeah. And I don't want to say messes with. I want to use a different word that I'm not going to use on the podcast. <laughs> um, and I really do think that he messes up a lot of his own pacing. Um, the Jabba scene messes that up. The entrance into to Mos Eisley yeah, messes like, that up. Yeah. But the flip side of that is that uh, the... The arrival at the Death Star and the escape from the Death Star immediately, like those scenes immediately, are enhanced. Actually, blasting out of Mos Eisley is enhanced. That is much better than it is in the original film. Oh, yeah. Um, and the final battle is... It's night and day. Mm. Uh, I love and appreciate the original special effects that were done for the Death Star battle. But they, you want to talk about slow and dated? It's a completely different movie. Yeah, it's a completely, completely different movie. Mm-hmm. And there's a couple things in there, like the X wings all sort of coming towards the camera. That it's a little bit like let's let's sit on these X wings for a while because we can. Because look at how cool this is. What we mm-hmm. did. The other thing is that that's 1996, 97 technology. Right. And honestly, if if you want to put that out in high def, you need to go back and you need to redo those effects with modern tech. Yeah, because that's the like that's the weird thing is it's sort of this modern but not quite modern. Yeah. Add a, like up update to it. Yeah. Um. Also, like, correct me if I'm wrong. Yeah. But like, it sort of takes place in like a day. Does it? Star not? Wars. Yeah. Roughly. Yeah. And he just feels he's like I really miss Ben, and it's like. Yeah. Come on, you knew him for like six hours. Yeah, like so one of <laughs> one of the one of the apologist justifications for that moment, okay, is that hyperspace travel actually takes time. Okay, right? in the storytelling, sure. it happens pretty much instantaneously, but in Star Wars for- lore, it's like that trip from Tatooine to Alderaan is at least a couple of days. Okay. Right, and that also explains why Luke has more ability to use the Force in Empire Strikes Back than we thought, because he actually, he actually spent like a week days, yeah. with with Ben Kenobi, yeah. not a day. Yeah, right. Um, well, that's kind of the answer I want. He's also to the son of the Chosen One, but, but still, yeah, yeah. Um, okay, so are we getting into Star Wars? I, yeah, yeah, I know no, that we're I in it. Brought already. us in it. We're I brought us in it. it. Yeah, but uh. That's a segue, by the way. I know. I just didn't point it out because I thought you were going to get mad yeah. at me for. I just just to just to, like... to put the conclusion on my thesis. We talked about what is not a good segue. Yeah. Actually, 
to be honest, there's a perfect segue earlier in the podcast that I won't point out Mm -hmm. and people can go back and find it after (laughs) this now. So there is a perfect segue in this podcast. There is your perfect segue that you call out thus (laughs) breaking the perfect segue and now just being a a change from one section to another. And but very then, with intentionality. And then and then the segue that we just did, which was a good segue, yeah, okay. uh, in, into this. So there we go. This okay. That's my three paragraphs. There's okay. an actual perfect segue, okay. a not perfect segue, okay. and then and then the one that we just explained. Right. So everybody can go back and... And just understand... Learn how to do segue. The segues. thesis of a segue. Yeah. What the hell was I going to talk about now? I don't know. <laughs> I, Star Wars... I think it was, yeah, it was actually, I think it's the Ben stuff. So it's really hard. I've never done this. I've never watched all the movies sequentially within like a month of each other. So going off of these prequels that have often in my brain just been, you know, the prequels that I watched after I watched everything else to now go and watch them as a narrative arc. Obi-Wan Kenobi makes no sense in Star Wars. Like how he's just like, Hey, this person that I've been trying to protect my entire life, I'm just going to give you this lightsaber and you're now going to become a Jedi. Like, I don't, is it because R2-D2 comes to him and he's like, oh my God, these droids that I thought I lost intentionally many years ago have now come back to me and I therefore need to like make Darth Vader's son into a Jedi. Like, I just, it's a weird thing to see because the Obi-Wan that, that like exists at the end of. Revenge of the Sith seems so like it's just it's just an interesting sort of why does he choose to teach Luke about all of this stuff? I, I you don't have to answer. No, no, no. I'm going like, to answer it. So uh, Obi Wan actually explains it in the movie. You just have to read between the lines. Okay. Uh, Han. And uh, they they hide in the cargo compartments, yeah. the smuggling compartments on the Millennium Falcon. Falcon, and I think is it Han? It's either Han or Luke that says like, "That was lucky," and Obi Wan says, "In my experience, there's no such thing as luck." What he means is the Force is the reason why. Right. They like they walked into a bar in most Eisley. There's more than one bar in most Eisley. It's a right. big city. Right. It's a spaceport, right? Like it's it is basically docking bays and bars. Yeah. They walked into that one. Mm-hmm. He walks up to the bar and happens to bump into Chewbacca, an old ally of the Jedi. Oh, one of the yeah. one of the individuals responsible for saving Yoda and getting him off of Kashyyyk in order that so that he survives the Jedi purge. You don't think that they had a conversation about that? Like, Chewie's not an idiot. Chewie, so this is the other thing is you got to look at the perspective of Chewbacca and Han Solo, okay? Chewbacca, everybody goes, oh, Chewie's the dog. Han's the Han's the human. No, it's not. No, <laughs> It's the other way around. Chewie's like 400 years old, like 200 years yeah, old, right? Yeah. Wookiees live to be 400. <laughs> Han dies in The Force Awakens. Spoiler alert. We're not there yet. But he dies in The Force Awakens. Chewie's like beat up about it. But he's not like gnashing of teeth and tearing of sackcloth upset. He's like, you can't... his own son just killed him? I'm going to shoot him in the side. Like he doesn't, he's not like enraged or like, like, yeah. like he goes and he gets the Falcon and he saves Ray and Finn. Right. And they fly off and he doesn't even hug Leia because he's like, whatever this is all sort of justification but um but it's like like han is like chewie's third dog (laughs) it's like this one lived a long time especially considering how much garbage it keeps eating right like people who have dogs who have had dogs understand that like you, you do your best to keep these things from killing themselves on a regular basis. And that is Han Solo to Chewbacca. He's like, every time I turn around, you're stealing money from another guy with a gun. Yeah. Stop it. You had a good thing. You could have just been actually, a racer. Right? So My favorite. Oh, I'm, no, we're not there yet. But because yeah. I did just watch The Force Awakens is the best moment between Han and Chewie yeah. is when he goes, yes, I did every time. Yeah. And it's just like, like 
like you just Chewie has the best like because of Chewie has all of the best lines in Star Wars. Chewie and R2 have the best lines in Star Wars. We just don't know what they're saying. I know. Um, Yeah, for sure. I no, but so from my reading of Star Wars as a saga, Chewbacca's at the bar. Mm -hmm. Obi-Wan walks into a bar, looks over, sees a Wookiee at the bar and goes, there's a Wookiee in this bar. Wookiees are a lot of things as a culture, right? And he knows that because he's Obi-Wan Kenobi. He's been around the galaxy a couple of times. He also knows Wookiee, no friend of the Empire. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I'll be fine. Right. This this guy, if 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 I talk to him and I can trust him, very few Wookiees are untrustworthy. Yeah. And very few Wookiees would sell us out to the Empire because the Empire enslaves Wookiees, right? Mm -hmm. So, like, he makes a calculated decision to go over and talk to this Wookiee. This Wookiee, being a very smart, very well-traveled Wookiee who's dealt with Jedi in the past, would look at Obi-Wan Kenobi and go, those aren't common robes as much as you want to act like they're common robes. Chewbacca, again, being smart, would see a laser sword on his yeah. waist and go like, you're a Jedi. <laughs> and like, and Chewie's not going to take anybody over to Han to right, introduce yeah, them, fair, yeah. right? They strike up a conversation, they do their thing, and then Luke gets himself into trouble, and Obi-Wan whips out the lightsaber, and at that point, Chewie's like, yep, that's a Jedi, <laughs> we're gonna help these guys, right? And takes him over to Han. None of that is a coincidence, hmm. right? Obi-Wan was listening to the Force, following its guidance, Luke coming to him at that moment, at the right time, uh, this convergence of things... I mean, for Luke to come to him and then be like, this droid says he has a message for you. It's like, that is ridiculous. I've never owned a droid, being, meaning that he's a Jedi. He doesn't own anything. It's like, this droid says okay, he belongs to Okay, that is a blatant, yeah, okay. Well, no, he's okay, like, so, I yeah. don't remember ever owning a droid. And he never owned R2 anyways. Yeah, it was never his so. droid. Yeah. He never owned a droid. The Jedi Temple, like the Jedi yeah. organization owned droids. He yeah. never owned anything. Yeah. Um. But it is I to guess, then to then look but, and, yeah. and like this projection comes out of it and it's Leia and it's like I am one of three people in the galaxy that knows that that woman is that man's sister. Right. And somehow this droid that is their father's droid, <laughs> along with the one that he built. Right. Showed up on my door, not on my doorstep. He but was like, out looking yeah, yeah, for them, but yeah. like have showed up at this moment with the kid and a message from his sister. That's not a coincidence. Yeah, That's okay. the force. Now is the time. Luke is the chosen one. Now we can restore balance to the force. Right. And yeah. that's when he turns like it's it's at that point that he turns and goes, well, you're going to have to learn the ways of the force if you're going to come with me to Alderaan. He right. doesn't say it as like, do you want it? Like, it's exactly the same as Harry Potter. Right. It's <laughs> like Hagrid turns and he goes, you're a wizard, Harry. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah, it's not this yeah. isn't a choice. Like, yeah. and I think that when we get to The Last Jedi, if you sort of take this reading of it, Luke in The Last Jedi is very much going. I do have a choice. Mm. The choice is to not care about anyone or anything and to shut myself off from the force. Because up until that point, he's been told since the moment that he met Obi-Wan Kenobi, you have to save the galaxy. Right. No one else can do it. Right. It's you. And every step of the way, it gets the burden gets heavier and heavier and bigger and bigger. And at a certain point, his sister and his best friend come to him and say, there's something wrong with our son. It has to do with the force. We can't deal with it. You have to fix this. And he can't fix it. And because he can't fix it and because of what he ends up ultimately doing, igniting the lightsaber, he goes, I give up. Yeah. Like, because that's the only, that's the only choice that he has, right? The choice is to, to continue watching people that he cares about get hurt or to just walk away and not watch them get hurt anymore. It's basically suicide without suicide right mm -hmm. and that all starts in that moment of obi-wan not giving him a choice and going like you have to learn the ways of the force and it's like he didn't ask him are you coming with me to alderaan to yeah. save this this princess like are you gonna are you, are you gonna do this mm -hmm. we, we we gotta go save the galaxy are you coming he just goes like you're coming mm -hmm. and then luke's like i can't come and he's like no you're coming mm -hmm. there's no way you're not coming 
and then everything happens right and like that's it's there's no it's a it's a Taoist principle and it's sort of the idea of like there are no mistakes there are no coincidences everything happens for a reason it's all a sequence of events and even more than that it's not some predetermined fate but it's more so uh like what what's gonna happen is gonna happen and worrying about it or or being upset about the past doesn't change now Mm -hmm. and now is all that matters and right now in front of you luke you have the opportunity to save the galaxy are you gonna do it and i'm sure in obi-wan's head if if it went a different way and luke was like nope there's no way there's no Mm -hmm. way obi-wan was like well then obviously it's your sister yeah right Right? like he would have but he's presented with this boy in front of him in this moment Mm -hmm. and he goes well it must be you Right, right um and and that's where he follows the the logic that we hear in in uh, empire where he goes that boy was our last hope and then yoda says no there's another um which that's that's still a little disappointing to me in the sequel trilogy that that promise isn't fulfilled of like we get to the future and leia is still leia she hasn't learn the force she hasn't become a jedi it's like that's that to me is a little bit disappointing but it's also but she's also better would, served as a general of course she and is and so because if she became a jedi she yeah. wouldn't have had been able to do she makes the choice yeah to have ben and to be yeah. like a mom and to yeah. be a from general. a story perspective in that sense of like balancing the characters and everybody having equal parts and things to do mm-hmm. i totally agree but in the story sense of like Yoda makes this comment and the galaxy is in shambles and it needs the new Jedi to rise yeah. and Leia goes, eh, no, I don't want to. Right. But, but that almost, I mean like that in the same way that Ray and obviously we'll talk a lot more about Ray when we get to the sequel stuff, um, their reluctance, which is very different from Luke's reluctance to be heroes <clears throat> is what makes them perfect heroes. Mm, yeah. Right. They're selfless in their heroism. They do it not because, like, Luke does it out of a sense of, like, adventure and excitement, mm-hmm. as Yoda points out to him in Empire. Ray is doing it because she's compelled and because her friends are in danger, right? right? Yeah. Like, she acts mostly because, like, she tries to run away from it a couple of times, but it's not the same as Luke, who's like, hey, it's a different kind of fear. I don't know. There's like, yeah, there's, no, no, there's no, a subtle mean, difference yeah, yeah. there. Um, okay. I can't stop not talking about, I just, cause I thought about this as well yeah. the other day about in the force awakens. If Kylo had wanted to, could he have just floated Ray into the ship, but he like chooses to carry her. Cause with the force couldn't in he the just, force like, awakens. Yeah. In the force awakens. Yeah. Yeah. But I was like, really, I don't know. I just ship them so hard. <laughs> I love the force is like controlling the force takes effort Mm -hmm. right yeah and that's this is one of the things that i think the sequels do a really great job of explaining um through storytelling not by ever saying it well Mm -hmm. i guess by saying it because he says like the if you're not doing this the The effort effort would kill kill you you. Yeah, yeah but um just sort of in subtle ways like that they explain that like these 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 actions come with consequences Right. Um, And it's even more subtextual in in the original trilogy and the prequel trilogy. The idea that the dark side especially takes a a very heavy toll. Mm -hmm. Um, And Palpatine is the best evidence of that. I mean, like Mm -hmm. he's disfigured and gross Mm -hmm. and whatever, because he taps into the dark side to the full extent in order to defeat Mace Windu. And he turns into a gross prune faced monster right um so yeah i mean like that that yes yes kylo could have done that but it also would have taken right just makes more sense to carry her okay yeah Yeah. he's also very muscular as we learn in the last jedi so he's perfectly fine with just carrying her so it's yeah i guess it's it's the idea of like could you run everywhere that you go of course you could (laughs) but you're going to walk most of the time, <laughs> right? So, yeah, could Kylo Ren use the Force to fly? Yeah, but it would be an incredible effort to do it 
why not just walk yeah okay. why not use a spaceship <laughs> right like yeah so it's just that kind of a logic yeah. um yeah back to a new hope yes i i i don't know what is it, it I, what else what else is there to say about it like i know some of my favorite <clears throat> overall star wars lines are in yeah. a new hope like the han in the everything's fine here how yeah are we're you? all fine here now yeah. how are you yeah <laughs> is that is certainly classic. one of the best lines in all of star yeah. wars um yeah and that's i think that's the moment when people really fall in love with han solo <laughs> yeah because, because he's such an, he doesn't know what he's doing <laughs> up until that point he's so full of himself yeah. and he's so and it's so obvious that he's full of himself <laughs> yeah and it's in that moment that that you realize that it's all a facade Yeah, that he also recognizes that he's full of it. <laughs> yeah. Right. Um, and, and when he kind of cringes away <laughs> yeah. from it, where he's he like, knows what he did. because the other part of it is that now that we know from solo and we, we knew from books and stuff like that before, but now we like have full confirmation in solo. He was an Imperial officer at uh, one point. Oh. Right. Oh, or yeah, Imperial right. cadet. Right. Oh, I totally forgot. Yeah. And and a soldier. So he knows Imperial protocol and what he's doing there is going like, Oh my god, it's been like it's been like eight years <laughs> since I've had to do this. Uh what's gonna stop them? Well, we've got a reactor leak, it's <laughs> very dangerous. Just give us a few minutes to lock it down. And then they're like, What we have sensors. There's no reactor leak in there. The last thing we saw was you guys shooting the cameras. <laughs> Um, we can play back the tape. It's the future. <laughs> like yeah. it's the future in the past in outer yeah, space, yeah. but it's the future. Yeah, right. Yeah. Um, and he's just going like, uh, 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 <laughs> I just got to stall them. Yeah. And then his ultimate solution is to shoot the, yeah. the, the comm <laughs> yeah. panel. And it's like, what, well, what's just, that going to do? You just turn it off. Yeah. yeah just like, stop talking to yeah. them. Um, but he's Han Solo, so it's it's a perfect Han Solo moment. Um, yeah, I, so the last time that I watched A New Hope was after seeing Solo and, uh, I'm, I'm pulling back the curtain. I didn't watch it this weekend. Mm -hmm. Uh, I, I have seen Star Wars A New Hope hundreds of times. I'm good. I, I, I know it well enough to have this conversation and to rank it. And I was almost as cocky, but then realized that I probably haven't seen it as many times. Yeah. And in my... You also haven't done this my, exercise, I which is the important part. Which is, yeah. And, and also, I was so jet lagged that I will admit, I may have closed my eyes a little bit <laughs> during That's my... Fine. But it's so loud that you can't, like, not... You can't sleep while you're watching it. But I'm just like, it's that thing where I was like, I'm waiting for my laundry to be done. And I'm just like... Well, I was like, sit here. It's just, it's the lightsaber fight. I can hear the lightsabers. <laughs> it's fine. That's but, fine. You don't yeah. miss much in that lightsaber yeah. fight. Yeah. Um, yeah, but I, so after watching A New Hope, after watching Solo, mm-hmm. um, and this is, this is why I think that Solo is such a great film. It does exactly what it's supposed to do, which is it informs that character mm-hmm. throughout A New Hope, Empire, and Jedi. Yeah. And what you actually end up seeing is not an arc, but the the bottom half of the circle. Right. Because you start in Solo with him as a kid, and he's very much like Luke. He's very earnest. He's very hopeful. He's very altruistic. Um, the whole thing of, like, I'm going to go back to Corellia, and I'm going to save Kira. And it's like, and, and like, I... Uh, 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 John Favreau's character. Uh, oh, what's the 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 guy with the arms? Yeah, I don't know. He's an Ardinian. I yeah, know the yeah, species. Yeah, yeah, I can't remember yeah. his name right now. Um, it's something with an R. But I uh, he uh, he's like, you're gonna go back to Corellia? Why are you gonna go back to Corellia? First of all, I love that that's John Favreau. That's yeah, the voice right? of that character. Yeah, he's yeah. my favorite character in that movie, other than Han. I yeah. uh, John Favreau just is like killing so it. Good. I oh, rewatched Friends recently, yeah, and him being in he's Friends. He's great in Friends, and you're isn't like, he? "Oh man, John yeah. Favreau, you don't even know what the future is in store for you. You don't yeah. even know." Yeah, um, no, he's one of my favorite people yeah, in Hollywood for sure. I, I just watched Chef last week, oh, which is I was a total non sequitur. Because that's the, that yeah. movie is so good. That movie's a perfect ten, oh, and nice. it's like this is a category that I have of like these are movies that like what are you going to change? Yeah. What do you change in that movie to make it any better? You can't. 
if you change anything, you're just going to wreck it. It's nice. a perfect movie. Nice. Ghostbusters, Back to the Future 1, Star Wars. I want to re- watch Chef then. I'm excited. Special edition, maybe not as yeah, much, say, but yeah. <laughs> the original Star Wars. Um, but yeah, the, 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 the story of Han Solo, he starts in that place very much like Luke. And he has this arc over the course of that movie in Solo where he learns to not trust anybody. Right. Right. Yeah. The only person he trusts is Chewbacca at the end of that yeah. movie. Right. Um, Cause what we get is at the beginning, it, Beckett teaching him and he's like, Oh, you better be paying attention. And then at the end of the movie, he shoots first, he kills Beckett, even though he doesn't want to, but he does it because that's how you survive. And he doesn't trust anybody now. Like yeah. that's, and then Kira takes off in the ship and we've got that moment of the two of them looking at each other and he's, in shadow and it's just this moment of darkness until Chewie walks up behind him and puts his arm on him. And it's like, there's just that little sliver. There's a, Chewie is that tether to the original Han Solo. Right. Mm-hmm. But who we see in the beginning of a new hope is the jaded cynical, yeah. like he, he, that happened to him and then everything else has happened to him as well. Yeah. yeah. It's just been a series Where he of, became indebted to smuggler, like to, to, as a to, smuggler yeah. to, to Jabba. And... Yeah. So we pick up with him in A New Hope and he's just like, he's still the same guy underneath. Yeah. But he's forgotten that that's who he is. And we see him go through that movie. And at the end of that movie, he's like, you know luke's like well you take care of yourself it's what you're best at right yeah and and he turns to chewing he's like what are you looking at i know what i'm doing and and they take off but of course then he comes back at the last minute to save the day and to help destroy the death star and he gets his medal and he's a hero i have that medal it's right up there i have one i know i saw it as um, I, when i came in yeah thank you thank you matthew campbell for bestowing mm-hmm. that upon me i uh, uh, he gave that to me when we were in disneyland yeah. back in september i yeah, and uh, and then despite all of his cynical attitudes and everything, in Empire he's still there. Yeah, and he's like, I gotta go, I I gotta go, and you can tell that that conversation has, has happened. happened more than once. Yeah, yeah, because Leia's like, whatever, yeah. go. <laughs> Yeah. Go, I don't care. Yeah. Right? She totally cares. <laughs> yeah. But General Riken's just like, all right, I hate to lose you. You're a good fighter. It's like, it's, you're not going anywhere. <laughs> yeah. He's like, the only thing that could have made that more obvious is if Riken looks over at Leia and he goes, yeah, sure. See ya. <laughs> and it's like, as long as she's here, you're not leaving. <laughs> um, But yeah, like, it, and then we see that, that, grow over the course of that movie until he makes the sacrifice at the end and then comes back in return of the jedi and when he comes back in return of the jedi cynical han solo is gone yeah he's all like he comes out of the carbonite and he's he goes i was rescued and yeah and he's rescued by this by this by this uh woman and i think that now you look and we'll talk about this when we get to return of the jedi as well but now you look at his arc all the way from the beginning of solo and he loved Kira and he was willing to do anything to get back to her and to save her and get her off Corellia. Like he put himself at risk in order to do that. And she ends up betraying him in the end, although she doesn't. She's actually saving him yeah, from Dark yeah, Maul, but yeah. he doesn't know that. Yeah. And so he's learned not to trust anybody, especially women. He doesn't have any meaningful relationships except for Chewbacca. And then this kid and this old man come along with these robots <laughs> and ruin everything. And then this woman <laughs> is just this thorn in his side that he just can't get rid of, but he doesn't want to. Yeah. Um, it's like it's it's like when you get that feeling in your mouth where it hurts, but you can't stop pushing it with your tongue. Yeah. Right. Oh, and you're yeah. just like like stop. <laughs> That's exactly their relationship to a T um, until the moment that he makes that sacrifice. And then she sacri- like she puts herself in mortal danger to rescue him. And that's when he goes, these people care about me. Yeah. Like they, I was a goner. Like I'm, I was toast and they still saved me. Yeah. And, and, uh, and that's when he, he's like, well, I guess I'm a general in the rebellion. now. That's yeah. what I am. And, Aww. Uh, and then this it's a circle, so he ends up going all the way back. We miss a trilogy in between yeah. Return of the Jedi and The Force Awakens. There's a whole trilogy story in there. Somewhere. Yeah. Um, where he then goes back to being cynical. Yeah. 
Yeah. Um, and then we see him come back uh, to to the real Han at the end of Aww. The Force Awakens, right? So it's it, like, that's why Solo is a great movie because it adds to all of that, right? It also, when we get to Empire next week, it adds so much to the scenes between Han and Lando. It's oh, so, yeah, I guess so. Okay, interesting. good. Okay. It's so good when you watch that movie with that in the back of your mind. Um, yeah. The other thing is like, for me, my impression of Obi-Wan post uh, prequels and clone wars is very different from what you said. Uh, yeah. That moment when he's telling the story of Anakin to Luke is one of the most heartbreaking moments in the entire saga for me, because oh. that's when you find out, especially like if you sort of track it chronologically, you think like if you, you have to, it's abstract thinking. Cause obviously one movie came out before the other, but if you think about it in this way, you see him in at the end of revenge of the Sith, he gives up on Anakin. Like we talked about on the yeah. last episode, yeah. he looks back at him and he goes, you're on fire. Yeah. You're like, dead. Yeah. Like, like, your family you're my best friend you were my brother and now i'm gonna walk away while you burn to death and all i can hear are your screams so i can't bring myself to look at it yeah and watch you die right like i got like he walks away and you think like wow he really like he does not love anakin anymore right and then you get to a new hope and there's this amazing thing that happens where Alec Guinness somehow delivers a performance with all of the subtext of that story without that story existing already. Hmm. Right. And you watch that and, and he talks about Anakin and he's like, he, he, he was a good friend. Like he, when he says, you know, like he was, he was the best star pilot in the galaxy and a good friend. And he kind of like pauses and then he goes, that reminds me. And it's so he like Obi-Wan changes the subject because he's getting too emotional in that moment. Mm-hmm. Like he's he's about to crack thinking about Anakin. And he goes, that's right. I have a lightsaber for you. This is exciting. This is cool. Let's change the subject. All right. right. And and it's like there, there's a really cool edit that that a fan did where they take that and they sort of overlay everything that obi-wan's saying with moments from oh, from the, pa- from the yeah, prequels they, yeah i think i've seen that yeah yeah and it's and it's really poignant and uh and really beautiful and and obviously i have a connection to that character that's that's much deeper than your connection to that character correct but uh, i like alec guinness though yeah like i just i i don't know i i think that that the one thing the prequels do really well is they inform that character's story Mm, and then a new hope being like this perfect button on the story of obi-wan kenobi of like he find like destiny fulfilled right he he luke comes to him he starts luke on his journey and he knows that he's not gonna die but he faces he confronts vader in the same way that in empire yoda or in Jedi Yoda basically tells Luke, like you have to confront Vader. If you want to be a Jedi, you got to confront Vader. That's what Jedi do. Right. And Obi-Wan knows like from the moment that he sees Luke, he's like, this is where this is going. Hmm. Like, like that kid shows up in his life again and he goes, well, it's been a good run. Like let's, well, let's see this one through to the end. And they get to the death star and he's like, Vader is here. He knows I'm here. This is what it's all been building towards, but it doesn't matter because he's going to do this and I'm just going to be a blue ghost. Right. right? Um, in the same way that Luke's story, and I think in the back of Luke's head, Ray shows up and he goes, this is the end of my story. Oh, yeah. Right. Like this is yeah. like this, like history is repeating here? itself again. Yeah. Yeah, and yeah, it's very much like he's yeah. Luke is the audience, and he's yeah. kind of it's the meta narrative of like yeah, but why you? Yeah, like yeah. what's special about you? Well, yeah. I'm a Jedi. Yeah, and it's like not yet. You're not, yeah. and yeah. I'm not gonna make you a Jedi because if I make you a Jedi, that means I turn into a blue ghost. <laughs> I don't want to be a blue ghost because if I wanted to do that, I would have disappeared years ago. Yeah, that's the other thing about Luke's story that's really interesting is that he goes to an island, 
He cuts himself off from the force. But, like, Yoda's just like, I'm old. I'm tired. I'm going to die now. Yeah. And he's like, Luke, you're here. I got, like, two things to say to you. Yeah. And when we get to Return of the Jedi, I'll talk about this more. But there's a great moment there where it's, like, where Yoda's like, I'm going to go to sleep now. (laughs) And he's like, we're done with this conversation. (laughs) And Luke prods him. and 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 Luke is basically like whatever i mean like you lied to me and then yoda rolls back over and then like dresses him down and then goes Are we done rolls over again and disappears <laughs> right, yeah. because he's like i've had enough of these skywalkers <laughs> telling me my business <laughs> it's so good yoda's yoda's such a great character um yeah i we haven't even like talked about leia at all uh, I mean, yeah, but also we've been podcasting for so long. For a long time. I'm so jet lagged. But we can, I mean, there's not It's only much been two hours. But how great she is. I don't know. She's she's Leia. She's, she has the buns like the whole time, man. She's the original strong female character. OG. Right? Mm-hmm. Like. Yeah. In, in popular culture. Yeah. All of the ones that come after her are modeled yeah. after Princess Leia. Buffy the Vampire Slayer modeled after Princess Leia. It's really 100%. cool to watch it in that context and see these yeah. people that like were building these characters that are so iconic, but like just as a movie, like yeah. to go in and be like, this was just them being. They were characters. just doing what they were paid to show up and yeah. do. Yeah. They didn't know that they were creating archetypes that would last yeah. 40 years yeah. Yeah. and influence everything yeah. else that would come yeah. after it. Like how could how could you possibly yeah. know that in that moment? But the thing that's this that's striking about it and that's so good and you watch it again and you just she's so tiny yeah. and in those scenes with Vader and with Tarkin and when yeah. she's like and she's just being like she doesn't care she doesn't care because she's also been around this like she's a rebel like she's been a rebel yeah. for so many years yeah and they just won their first big which is a thing too that i like rogue about one like rogue one helps helps yeah. color it yeah. in the idea that she was there yeah like she saw the first win that a lot had to do with the help that they were able to provide yeah. so that this could happen and they finally have gotten so close she's so close and she thinks that she's succeeded, right? Like she yeah. sent the plans away and they're going to go to her father and everything's going to be good. And she's yeah. just kind of being there being like, you know what? If I die, I succeeded. Like, it's just so badass yeah. and really awesome to see it. Yeah. And because she's so tiny, the way that those have to be filmed is just so awesome to like, see the, like it's all in profile. wide and, shots, and wide. right? Yeah, yeah, because yeah, you couldn't you get close get in on yeah. those three characters yeah. at the same time. Yeah. Yeah. It's really yeah. cool. No, it's awesome. Yeah, I love it. I love any of the shots that are framed. I mean, like when when Tarkin enters uh, and Vader is behind Leia and we get the one shot of Leia and Vader's standing behind her and he's basically just a shadow. shadow. Yeah. Like he's yeah, just, just this massive thing. And 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 with the context oh, of the prequels, her that's her father. And oh. he doesn't know. Right. He's and it's like when we get to Return of the Jedi, it's so amazing that I uh, he doesn't realize until that moment. And then there's also like the thing of like, does he realize sister Leia? I don't think he does. Yeah, he might not understand. Who he just yeah, he, he just, just reads sister. Luke's thoughts yeah, yeah, yeah. and he is like, is. you have a sister like that's yeah. who, that's well, if you won't turn, maybe she will. Yeah. And. It, but like, really knows that it's her. Yeah. Yeah. Like, yeah. like he doesn't, he doesn't have the full context yeah. of like, you almost killed her. You yeah. put her in a room and tortured her for yeah. hours. But also the so thing weird. that's so great is that she knows who he is. Yeah. And the sass that she has, where she's just like, ugh. Of course, you're holding Vader's leash. Like the idea that, like, she just like is talking down to this person who actually yeah. has a lot of power. Pa- it's just, it's really cool. I always forget that. She that. knows, like, like, by reputation, but she yeah, doesn't fully, fully understand, understand. Yeah, yeah. what she's talking about. Yeah, well, because she doesn't get like yeah. the force and yeah. all that jazz. But also, just like she's just so angry. Like she grew up with people that knew who she was. Well, like, so like, part the, of that yeah. as well. And the idea that they never let her have sympathy for the Empire, and they always yeah. sort of taught her who who was evil and that she just kind of like when when han like puts off the gun or whatever he shoots in the trash compactor she just like rips him a new one being like what are you doing shooting in this thing you idiot like anyways yeah well and the the subtext of of 
the the stories that we don't know between her and her father oh yeah that must have occurred yeah as she was like taking uh, a spot in the senate yeah and it's like he's you know that bail organa was looking at that and going like i don't want you to be this close to yeah. everything that's happening i want to protect you but i also know that i can't yeah because you're leia yeah. and there's nothing i can do about <laughs> any of this you're gonna do whatever you want to do anyways but him, you know that a, he told her a lot of stories about Obi-Wan Kenobi, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. That yeah, she yeah. was like, I'm going to go find Obi-Wan Kenobi and give him these plans yeah. and recruit him. And he's get, and then yeah. we're going to have the Jedi and the Jedi are going to save the galaxy yeah. and all of that. Like, you can tell that she's like, I'm on a mission. I'm going to go get the Jedi. And the other part of it is that you know that Bale on multiple occasions was like, whatever you do, never, ever confront Vader. Yeah. <laughs> Because Bail Organa is one of the three people in the galaxy that knows that Anakin Skywalker is Darth Vader. Yeah, yeah. Right? Actually, Tarkin knows. Uh, not Tarkin. Uh, well, no, Tarkin does know, and Thrawn knows as well. So there's like five people in the yeah. galaxy. Six. Which one's Thrawn? Thrawn isn't in the movies. He's from oh, the, he's the expanded the, yeah, universe. Yeah. yeah. Um, Tarkin isn't in the prequels, though, yeah. He's, he is in Revenge of the Sith at the very end. He's in the final scene. Oh, when they're looking at the thing yeah. being built, yeah. right. But yeah, yeah, he's yeah. also in the Clone Wars, and he there's a few episodes where he's very closely involved with Anakin Skywalker, and they're kind okay. of buddies. Gotcha. So there's a... there's it's I, I don't know that it's actually... So maybe in one of the books it's stated that Tarkin knows. It was very yeah. heavily implied that Tarkin, that Tarkin would know that Anakin and Vader are the okay. same person. Aside from the Emperor and Thrawn, but Thrawn figures it out. Nobody tells Thrawn. He figures it out by deduction because that's his character. But other than uh, the Emperor, Tarkin is the only other person, theoretically, who's supposed to know. Right. That Anakin Skywalker. Right. Because there's nobody else in the room when that happens, right? Right. The clones bring him in and presumably all those clones are dead. Um, and, uh, and it's only droids in the room right. when he becomes yeah, yeah, Darth Vader. Fair, so, yeah. uh, yeah, but you know that, that, that Bale was like, if you see Darth Vader, you walk the other way. Yeah. You yeah. don't never be in the room with him. Yeah. Certainly never be in a room alone with him. And then he sends her off to, to, to get Obi-Wan. Yeah. And that's in Rogue One. That's the story is that like, she's not supposed to be at the battle. She's supposed to, Bale says to Mon Mothma, Mon Mothma comes and goes like, your Jedi friend, is now's the time. Oh. And Bale goes, don't worry, I've got my best person on it. And that's, he's sending Leia to go get Obi-Wan. And then everything happens with Jin Erso and and Rogue One right. going to get the 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 Death Star plans, right. and then you know that like Leia intercepted those transmissions, like intercepted that everybody's like 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 going off to do whatever, and she was like, "There's no way I'm not going." Right, <laughs> right. Yeah, like yeah, she yeah. turned the tent of four around and went to Scarif too. Right. She's right. not supposed to be there, uh, and then right. because she does that. That's the only reason they win. That's the only reason they get the the plans in the first place because she defied her father and went and did that. And then was like, okay, now we got to go get Obi-Wan Kenobi. So yeah, it's a, it's one of those things where it's like, if she made a slightly different decision, what would have happened? Right. Mm -hmm. But, uh, cool. We can wrap it up. Yeah. Where do we rank a new hope in the, uh, in the definitive thunder quack ranking of the star Wars saga, the Skywalker saga. Um, can it be first? It can be first. It's number one. It is, yeah. Obviously. So the, so the ranking, the official ranking is at number four, the Phantom Menace yes. at number three, attack of the clones at number two, revenge of the Sith. And at number one, a new hope. Yeah. And is empire going to be number one next week? Okay. So here's the thing. I'm really looking forward to watching Empire this week. Yeah. Because of all of the originals, it's the one I've ironically seen the least. Because Even though it's the one everybody says is the best. It's the one that everybody says is the best because I think objectively it probably is. But because of my own biases of the series, mm-hmm. I don't have the same reverence for it as everybody else. Yeah. And so I'm really looking forward to watching it and kind of like with new like perception of like modern pop culture and see how I perceive it. Will I find it better than A New Hope? I yeah. don't know. 
because a new hope is a new hope like it's it's star wars and then jedi was the conclusion of that series because i like reading the final chapters more than reading the (laughs) middles but also like empire like is the saddest one Mm -hmm. like all the things suck in it so i don't know i don't know what i'm gonna say i feel like what what do you think do you like hands down think that you'll i don't know i don't know we'll have a discussion about it next week we'll figure it out but i'm excited yeah uh cool well thank you for listening uh as always you can head to thunderquack.com to check out all the other great podcasts in the thunderquack network uh and uh you can follow us on facebook at facebook.com slash thunderquack on twitter at thunderquacknet and on instagram at thunderquack podcast you can also follow us individually on twitter i'm at a conkin a k o n k i n you can add an 86 to that for instagram and i'm at arkwolf a r k w u l f uh, and of course, I, uh, nope, not of course. There's no other, of course, this is so hard. Cause I have all of the other ones I in know, my head. Yeah. Uh, if you like what you hear, you can yeah. support us in two ways. First by going to store.thunderquack.com to pick up some merch. Uh, and second by heading to patreon.com slash thunderquack and pledging your monthly support over there. So a dollar gets you access to the thunderquack podcast early, uh, as well as the Facebook group. Um, and, uh, of course, if you want the uncut Thunderquack podcast where we had a very lengthy conversation about a lot of things, <laughs> yeah. uh, you can get that at the $5 level and above. Uh, cool. Well, that's it for this week's episode. We'll be back next week, uh, to rank the empire strikes back and talk about, uh, the week's news. Uh, we'll see you guys next week. Help me, Obi-Wan Kenobi. You're my only hope. <laughs>